All right. All right. Welcome. Welcome. Happy Thursday. One of our last sunny Thursdays, I'm sure. <laughs> so thanks for hanging out with us. Today is a longer session than we're used to. So we're we're on the calendar for two hours. Um, so we've divided it into sections. So we'll, there will be breaks. We'll utilize the chat room. Um, so, you know, feel free if you need to use a restroom or anything, hop off the camera. And thank you, Pam, our word whisperer for joining us today. Um, she is a chief learning officer with Intelizi. And I'm not going to date you, Pam, but she's been using the original version of word back in the nineties. Don't do the math. She was seven. Um, it's so it's super special that we have her here, her here actually just it was fun getting this, <laughs> this training on the books but she's typically focused on training and learning strategy so it, it is really really special that we have her here because it's not typical that she's doing these type of presentations so seriously thank you for saying yes my pleasure so today we're talking about the wonderful world of word and how to teach us not so old dogs and some new tricks Microsoft Word is still the leading word processor on both Macs and PCs. It's not going anywhere uh, and you're going to run into it everywhere, especially with this group. We're in a very heady document, a document heavy environment and in industry. Um, we, we use it all the time, especially for us that wear many hats. Um, it still has some really great features when it comes to accessing help. But today we're bringing in the best Pam for the best you guys. Uh, she is going to give us some of our time back, make you look like rock stars. She's going to teach us how to use it effectively, smarter, faster, how to troubleshoot documents, tips, tricks, hacks, shortcuts. We're going to try to jam it all in two hours. Um, a lot of these techniques carry over to Excel and PowerPoint and Outlook. Um, so it's the subtle little things that you learn that will carry over and hopefully we'll continue on the training with them. So it doesn't matter what version you're using. There's a lot of crossover between the versions. So we're super stoked. Um, a little bit about Pam. Pam, I will be your hype squad after just reading your bio. You are a busy bee. She went to Purdue University. She has a bachelor's in English and history, a master's in corporate education and communication. So she's not a, she's not a very high achiever, clearly. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> she's clearly all about knowledge management. So she spent 30 years in learning and development, worked as an instructional designer, technical writer, e-learning developer, trainer, senior strategist. I, I mean, she literally has done it all for her current company. Um, she built the foundation for the change management consulting practice. Um, and then Somehow she has free time, and in that free time, she still continues her use of Word. She's even writing a novel in Word right now. So she loves creative writing, reading, traveling, and now hanging out with us. So, Pam, please take it away. Everyone sit back, relax. Well, everyone but Pam and enjoy. <laughs> Thank you so much for that lovely introduction. That makes me sound um, really way more fabulous than I actually am. Uh, I just have spent my whole career in one space. So after a long, long time, I guess the activities start to accumulate. Uh, but one of my first and true loves, honestly, was time in a classroom like this with students where I get the opportunity to try honestly and what I see is my job to help you uh, become better and more efficient at the work that you do. Um, and it's a real joy. So I'm, I'm super happy to be able to be in the classroom with you this afternoon. So on that note, I'm going to share my screen. And if you ever see me looking over here, I actually have two monitors. So I'm, <laughs> I'm not looking at anything more interesting than just other information that's on the screen. Um, all right. So let me just share my screen here. Everybody, can you see my screen? It should, excellent. Okay, great. All right. So I've really, I've got great uh, uh, information from everybody on, you know, kind of why you're in class, which is extremely helpful, but I would love for us to utilize the chat right now. This one of the, I, I love the fact that I can talk to all of you from the confines of my comfy home, but one of the downsides is that sometimes there's a barrier to, for people to interact. So I'd love for all of you just to use the chat right now and just tell me if you had to peg yourself, you know, would you consider yourself an intermediate, 
introductory or advanced user of words, if you had to categorize yourself, you can just throw one of those levels in there, intro, intermediate, advanced, just going to do a little quick pulse check on everyone. All right, a lot of intermediate levels. That's about pretty much where I expected everybody to fall. Um, I think anybody who uses Word regularly but haven't hasn't had a significant amount of formalized training probably would never feel comfortable enough to say that they were advanced. So that's about where I would expect everybody to fall. So that's fantastic. Okay, second question, follow up to that. Uh, Again, I got some great uh, feedback on the types of things you're interested in, and I have put together a program for the afternoon, but I'd love to hear if there's something really, really specific that you're hoping to take away from this, drop that in the chat. Hopefully, chances are, I already have that included in what I'm going to talk about, but if I don't, I'll either try to fit it in or I will follow up with you afterwards individually with a, a little bit of information on that topic. So I'm looking at this, I'm seeing lots of shortcuts, formatting, yep, styles, yeah, sometimes those can be uh, confusing. Tabs, okay, um, awesome. Carry with tabs, yeah, I don't use them. <laughs> That's my word whisperer trick 101 for you. Ditch them out the door. Uh, now, what I mean by that is oftentimes if I need to have like tabbed content, I'll put that in a table instead of using tabs. But I will actually show you, uh, like, to give you a conceptual understanding of tabs that I think will help. All right, fantastic. Thank you for that feedback. That is so helpful. I really don't see anything that anybody's thrown in there that I haven't sort of already made a plan for. Now, that said, this chat window is open. It is your way to communicate with me. So uh, feel free. I, I love to hear things in chat like, wow, I've never seen that before, or... That was super confusing. Can you show me again? Um, we also are a small enough group. I'm very, very happy to have anybody come off mic at any time to ask me a question. We will save room for questions at the end, but don't be bashful, okay? Because uh, I'm more than happy to help clarify something in the moment as well. Okay. With that said, let me get on my right monitor here. So, uh, Learning development specialists, we always have to have our objectives, right? What I hope everybody walks away with. So really what I'm going to focus on, the way I'm going to structure this, is to help you try to understand the logic behind Word, because there is a logic in what Word does. And if you understand the logic in Word, it's going to better enable you to troubleshoot your own documents. You will understand why Word does things that right now may puzzle you and feel like, you know, it's possessed. Um, it's not. It has an actual logic for why it does what it does when it does it. And that's what I want to focus on. And I'm going to do that by showing you how to do formatting, how to use styles, but also at the same time, giving you an understanding of why and how it works the way it does. Uh, definitely have baked in lots of shortcuts, shortcuts for navigation, for selecting, for formatting. Um, and we'll also look at styles, which are basically clusters or grouping of formatting that you can quickly apply. There was some interest in building table of contents or questions about tables of contents. Is that something that um, that folks do? If 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 not, then I I will set it to the side. But if it is definitely something that folks on the call do, we will cover. Okay, great. Yes. All right, great. So we'll talk uh, uh, a little bit about tables of contents. They really align with styles. So as you use the heading one, two, and three styles, those automatically would uh, you could build those from a table of contents. But I actually will also show you how you can manually mark something to go into the table of contents. So you don't only have to use headings. You can also manually mark and you can combine those two things. So you can use the heading styles along with manual markings to build your table of contents. And that's something that not everybody necessarily always knows in Word. I so I will show you that. Uh, we'll also look at working with tables. Tables are incredibly powerful. Uh, like I said, I use them all the time in lieu of tab stops. We'll also look at adding section breaks to your documents, and I'll explain why those are incredibly powerful in just a moment when we get into how Word thinks about documents. And then we'll also look at managing headers and footers. I find sometimes, um, especially in a document that has multiple sections, 
people come to me all the time, like basically practically on the verge of tears because they can't get their table of uh, their headers and footers to work properly. Uh, again, there's a logic behind that. I'm going to show it to you. And that doesn't mean you're not ever going to struggle with your headers and footers again. It simply means you're going to know how to fix it when the struggle appears. Uh, because sometimes even I will run into things where I'm like, oh, okay. Yeah, I just did that to myself. I know what I did. I'm going to fix it. So I'll help you understand that. And really, literally, some of these things I'm going to show you, like the headers and footers and how they work in conjunction with se section breaks, will actually inform you how to use other tools within Word, like watermarks, which kind of function the same way. So it's all going to become clear as we dig into this a little bit further. And I thought what I would do, first of all, is just start with some great navigation tips. So um, like Brittany said, you're going to have access to this PowerPoint slide deck when I'm done. I'll make sure uh, Brittany has it and she can send that out to all of you. Uh, so you'll have access to this. But as you can see, there are a lot of keyboard shortcuts that are available to you when you're working in Word. And let me just, I'm going to actually bring up a Word document here as well. Let me just find the one I'm going to open here. Okay, so here's a document that's pretty long. It's about 12 pages long. And I don't know if you're familiar with uh, some of the keyboard shortcuts, like my favorite, which is Control Home, which is the H-O-M home key on your keyboard. That will automatically take you to the very top of your document, Control Home. It's companion. Control end, the E N D end key, control end. I actually have a new, I have a new um, laptop this week and I don't know where all my shortcut keys are yet. Control end will take you to the very bottom of your document. So control home, control end, two of the most powerful shortcut keys in Word. Um, these also, by the way, are usable in other Microsoft products. So you can use control home in Excel to go to cell A1. For instance, you know, if you're in a big spreadsheet, you can use it in PowerPoint, you can use it in Word, you can use it in your Windows Explorer. So these keyboard shortcuts, try them in other places because they don't function only in Word. Let me go back to the top, Control Home. When I'm in, let me just zoom in a little bit here for you, make it a little bit easier to see, there we go. When I'm actually in a paragraph, I can use home all by itself to go to the beginning of the line or end to go to the end of a line. That's one way I could move. And then you can also, of course, use your arrow keys, right? Arrow up and arrow down, but you can combine your arrow keys with things like control down arrow. Control down arrow is gonna move you down one paragraph at a time. Control down arrow, control up arrow, up one paragraph at a time. Control and, where's my keys on this keyboard? Here we go, that's confusing. So I also have a control page up and page down that will take you up and down a screen full of information at a time. So control page up, control page down, two very powerful ones as well. So really cool things you can do. And obviously this list that I showed you is much more extensive than what I just ran through with you. But I wanted to make you aware that there are tons of navigation keyboard shortcuts. You will find the ones that you use most frequently and those are the ones that you'll have memorized. But these are really great and easy ways to move around your document in a faster, more efficient way. The second thing I want to talk about are selection tips. And if you'll notice, the table here did not change. And that is by design because all of these keyboard shortcuts, when you combine them with the shift key, turn into selection tools. So what do I mean by that? Let me go back to my document here. And I'm going to show you a couple of examples. OK. So here I am at the beginning of section two. And let's say I would like to select from this point where my insertion point is to the very, very end of my document. Well, I know control end goes to the end of my document, but if I hold the shift key down with it, so I do shift control end, it'll automatically, and I'm just gonna use my scroll bar over here. You see what it did? It automatically select everything 
from where my insertion point was down through the end of the document. So that's what I mean by coupling the shift key with any of those navigation shortcuts. So again, we know that if I use the end key all by itself, it goes to the end of a line. So if I do shift end from where I am, it automatically highlights the whole line. I also really loved the love the shift key with the arrows. So if I'm trying to select a certain area, oftentimes what I'll do is, you know, especially if I'm typing, I don't want to stop and pick up the mouse, right? There's an inefficiency there. I can quickly select what's on my screen just by holding down my shift key and using my arrows. And if I hold control with it, see how it's moving a word at a time? By itself, it goes one letter at a time. But if I hold down control shift, it hops a word at a time. So again, great way to be able to select information on your screen simply by using those navigation keystrokes that are there, adding the shift key with it. Pre-mouse days. Carrie, I lived those pre-mouse days. I actually taught word for DOS. Is that terrible? I'm like, I really just dated myself, didn't I? <laughs> um, I'm gonna, I have a sneaking suspicion, Carrie, you may have had some experience with WordPerfect. Do you, oh yeah, I still miss it to this day. Okay, not gonna lie. <laughs> so anyway, so some of these things that, again, we did in the pre-mouse day still apply here and can be extremely helpful when you're trying to bring back some efficiency into your work. So this is something that I'm just cluing you in on but that I'm going to encourage you to when you get this slide deck to take away and, you know, try playing around with some of these and see which ones are the ones that help you be more efficient. There also are a couple of other selection tips I can give you that are beyond that list that was there. So my absolute favorite is the keyboard shortcut control A, uh, A for all. It'll automatically select your entire document, control A. And again, control A is one of these universal keystrokes. So use that other places. You can use it all across Microsoft Office. And frankly, you can use it in a lot of um, uh, Google Workspace applications and in other programs as well to become kind of one of these universal shortcuts, control A. You also can quickly select a word by double clicking on it. So if you double click a word, automatically selects the whole thing. And if you triple click, it will select the entire paragraph that you're in. So double clicking gets you the word, triple clicking will get you the paragraph. The tricky part with triple clicking is you have to hold the mouse still. In other words, the mouse can't be swish, swishing around while you're double clicking or you triple clicking, otherwise it won't recognize the third click. But if you hold the mouse still, pretty easy to triple click, you'll get the whole paragraph. Also, if you do, a click to set the starting point and then a shift click to set the ending point, you can highlight everything in between. And this is really helpful if you want to select something that trips across the screen dividing line. So what do I mean by that? If I want to select uh, this section two, three, four, I also want to include six and seven that are on the next part of the screen. Depending upon how quickly things move, right? We get this action going, right? Where you go up, you go down, you go, wait a minute, that's too much, that's too little, that's not enough, right? I hate playing that game. I don't play that game anymore. What I do is I would click at the beginning of the section I wanted, which is here at number two, right? And then I'm gonna scroll down either with the rolly on my wheel, the wheel on my mouse, or with my scroll bar, I'm just gonna scroll down until I can see the last part I wanna select. Now I'm gonna hold my shift key and I'm gonna click where I want the selection to end. And automatically everything in between becomes highlighted. So the way that works again is you click at the beginning to set the initial marker, shift click at the end, everything in between becomes selected. Nice little trick there. And one more cool trick, what if I wanted to make changes to section one here, but also to section three? Let's say I wanna make both of these sections bold. 
probably what most people do now is they would select section one, make it bold, come back down, select section three, make that bold. You don't need to do that. If you hold down your control key, you can select chunks of text that are not contiguous with one another. So you can have breaks in between. So I could select all the areas that I wanted to make bold and then just bold them one time with one click because I highlighted them all at the same time. So again, the way I did that was the first selection is just normal. Any subsequent ones, I'm just gonna hold my control key down while I drag to select. And then I can make my formatting change and we're good to go. So that's another really great little um, selection shortcut for you. So shift and click for everything in between, control plus drag to select non-contiguous areas. And again, all of these little tricks I'm showing you, they don't just apply in Word. So try them out in other places. I think you're gonna be shocked when you see how many uses you'll actually have for these. Okay, so that kind of sets the table. I think the first thing we need to know how to do is move around efficiently in Word and then select things efficiently in Word. So hopefully some of these tips will help you in that area. But now what I wanna drill into is how does Word format? How does Word logically think about the documents that we build? And there's actually three types of formatting in Word. The first is character formatting. That's the easiest, right? It's probably what most people refer to when they talk about formatting. Bold, italicize, underline, font size, font color, the font choice itself. Um, more advanced character formatting, like superscripting, so it's a little raised above, or subscripting, so it's a little lower below the, the baseline of the, of the text. Um, kerning or spacing between the letters. Those are more advanced character formats, but all of that deals with the way the letters appear, which is different from paragraph formatting. That's the way chunks of text marked as paragraphs appear. So that's alignment, left, center, right, justified alignment, uh, how much space comes before or after a paragraph, indenting, line spacing, single space, double spaced, uh, tabs actually are a paragraph format. And that's where some people run afoul of it. They don't actually think of tabs as belonging to a whole paragraph, but they do. They live as part of the paragraph formatting set. Um, line breaks and page breaks are, are parts of uh, paragraph formatting. So too are numbered lists and bulleted lists. All of that are types of paragraph formats. And then the third and final type of formatting that Word does is section formats, which some people refer to as document formats, but it's a little bit misleading to just call it a document format. Um, when you start a document, you will have one section in it, right? It's just the document. But as you start to add other sections, or in some cases, some types of features that you might add from Word, Word will create sections in the document. And then the formatting can be applied just to those discrete areas of the file. So what are section formats or document formats? They're things that typically are done either to the whole document or to big swaths of the document. So these would be things like watermarks, headers and footers, page numbers, um, margins, page orientation, columns, newspaper style columns, all of those are considered section formats. Now, how many of you have ever used uh, the um, different first page for header and footer? Has anybody ever used that before? Yeah, a couple people have, great. So when you use that, you actually have added another section to your document. So even if you say to yourself, I've never used sections before, I don't know what those are. If you've used a different first page, you've taken advantage of section breaks. So what Word does in that instance is it actually adds the break for you so that the first page is considered section one and every sub and the next one is considered section two. If you add more breaks, then there you'd have a third section and a fourth section and so on. And what I then can do is apply these types of formats just to discrete portions of my documents. So where might this come in handy? 
has anybody ever had a table that's so wide that page really needs to be landscape orientation while the rest of it's going to remain portrait? Yeah, that's we've all sort of bumped into that before. You can actually create a section before and after that page. So we isolate the page with that wide table in its own little section. And you can then within that section decide to change the orientation to landscape. So only that page stays landscape and everybody else stays portrait above and uh, above and after. So that's an example of where these formattings for sections come into play. Before I go any further, does this make sense to everybody? Is everybody following me thus far? Because this is sort of the foundation that we're gonna launch off of. So if you are in any way confused, come right off mic and say, Pam, I need you to explain that again. Okay, awesome. Everybody seems good so far. Nobody be bashful. I don't wanna leave anybody behind. So feel free to, if you're not getting it, I have other ways to say the same thing. Don't worry about it. I can help you get there. Okay, looks like everybody's good. All right, great. Okay, so I wanna start with character formats because it's kind of the easiest one. It's the one that's sort of most self-explanatory and everybody understands. Uh, so we're just gonna look quickly at applying formats, but I'm gonna really start to talk a little bit here about non-printing characters and what those mean and why they're important. So let me pull up a document again. I'm gonna bring over a different one, whoops. Okay, so here's a pretty basic little document. I'm gonna select this first word at the top. And if I wanna do some character formatting to it, First and foremost, we always select before we affect, always. So in the case of characters, I have to specifically highlight each character that I want to make a change to. The font section is right here on my ribbon. So right here, I can do all kinds of things. I think this, I'm, I'm not going to go too deep into this because I think everybody probably has a pretty good idea about how to format characters. The only thing I'm going to call your attention to I'm going to call your attention to two things here. One is, I'm just going to make a couple of changes here. I'm going to make it bold. I'm going to make it underlined. Looks good. Maybe we'll change the color. If you want to remove formatting, of course, you can remove it a layer at a time, right? I could just remove the underlined. The underline's gone. But if I want to take this back down to default text, right? Let's say I got this from someone else, and I just want to strip the formatting and start over. This little icon right here, it's called the clear all formatting. When I click on that, it'll automatically erase all of the formatting. So I don't have to try to unwind it. I can just quickly do it that way. I also, and I'm going to use one of my favorite shortcuts ever, which is control Z, control Z, last letter of the alphabet, control Z, is a keyboard shortcut for undo. So I can also use, of course, undo up here as part of my title bar. I've got my little quick access um, shortcut keys. But control Z is a shortcut key for undo. There is a shortcut key as well for eliminating all of your formatting. And it is control shift and the letter N, control shift N. So that's I love the keyboard shortcuts, especially in Word, uh, because your hands are on the keyboard a lot. And when you have to stop to pick up the mouse, it, it really does take away from the flow of your work. So knowing some of these keyboard shortcuts can, I think, if you're a heavy Word user, make you more efficient. So I will be throwing out keyboard shortcuts um, as we go through the day. And the Control-Shift-N is an alternative for this guy right here, which is the clear all formats. Okay, so far so good. So character formatting, pretty straightforward. So then next formatting I wanna talk about, whoops, are paragraph uh, formats. But before I get there, I wanna take a step back for a second because now that we're gonna talk about paragraph formats, 
styles are going to begin to be part of our conversation. And I want to help you understand the way Word sets up a document. So we understand how it divides the type of formatting it does, but how are the documents set up as soon as we start them? So when you say, I want to create a new file, Word pulls up a template called normal.dot, and dot is the extension for well, actually dotx is the is the most recent extension. Dotx is the extension for a template, and the normal template is the default that you choose when you just hit new and you get the blank white document and you're off to the races. Now, what is part of the normal template? You have a series of paragraph styles that come with your normal template. They are a normal paragraph style, which is just what your generic text is going to look like as soon as you start typing. And then we have some styles for heading one, two, and three. Those are defaults that come standard with your normal template. Title, there are a couple of other ones that are um, more embellishment styles. And there are also hidden styles that come as part of your normal template that only become activated if you use a feature that needs that style. Great example are table of contents. So when you build a table of contents, it automatically will um, create the table, right? It puts in, it, it indents it a certain uh, level depending on whether it is a primary or a secondary entrance into the table of contents. You have um, dot leaders that lead up to the number, right? All of these things that Word automatically does for you. How does it know how to automatically do that? Well, it knows how it should make that appear because of these hidden default styles. There's a TOC1 style, TOC2, TOC3. But Word is smart now. It's not going to clog up your style list with a whole bunch of these hidden maybe styles or what I call them, right? Maybe you need them. It's not going to show it to you until you have added that feature that's using that style. Then you'll see it. So there actually are quite a few styles that are embedded into this normal template. And we see a subset of those styles that are sort of the working everyday styles that people generally tend to use. Everybody with me so far? Okay, great. All right, so now that we have an understanding of that, let's talk a little bit about paragraph formats. <clears throat> and in this, when I talk about this, I'm also going to talk a little bit about page breaks and using the ruler. So the ruler and my non-printing characters are two tools that I use to diagnose what's going on in a document. They help me read what's happening in the file. So if you're not someone who habitually uses the non-printing characters or the ruler, I'm going to make a case that you try to work with these two things because they're gonna help you diagnose what's going on in a document that may feel like it's possessed. Okay, so let me go back to my document here. And then we're gonna dig into this a little bit deeper. Okay, so taking a look again at this fairly generic little document here, if I want to format this little line of text, whoops, right here uh, at the top, this text that says Aromar, it's a company name. Uh, you know, maybe I want to, I'm gonna add some formatting to it. I'm gonna make it bold, I'll make it a little bit bigger, but this clearly is supposed to be kind of like the title of this file. So titles oftentimes are center aligned. Now, I told you just a minute ago that we always select before we affect, right? We have to select the thing before we can affect it. So how do we select a paragraph? How do we even know what is a paragraph? What does Word consider a paragraph? I mean, I know what my English teacher, Sister Joanna, taught me what a, a paragraph was, but Word defines a paragraph a little bit differently than Sister Joanna. Word considers a paragraph any amount of text that comes before you hit the enter key. All right. So when I do this, enter, 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 enter. Oh, look at that. I'm making a whole bunch of empty paragraphs, right? If I put just one or two words in front of this little paragraph marker, guess what? This is a whole paragraph. 
according to Word. If I have, you know, tons and tons of text, well, that's not tons, but that's a few lines of text. That is more traditionally what I, what we would consider a paragraph to be. But for Word, anytime you hit that enter key, you're saying new paragraph, new paragraph. Sometimes the paragraphs are empty. You don't have any words attached to them, but that's how Word defines what a paragraph is. So let's clean this up a little bit. I merely need to have my insertion point inside of a paragraph if I only want to affect one single paragraph. Just merely being inside the paragraph with your insertion point is your way of indicating to Word, this is the paragraph I've selected. So I technically don't have to highlight this entire line in order to make it center aligned. I simply have to have my insertion point somewhere in front of that little paragraph marker and I can hit the center align or right aligned or whatever I want to do for, for my paragraph formatting for this little line of text. So far, so good? Okay. So character formats attach themselves literally to the letter. So this is right now Calibri 22 bold. I can see that up here on the ribbon. If I remove the bold, it's going to remove it for that letter A. Par uh, paragraph formatting live inside of this non-printing character. That's where the formatting for paragraphs reside. So one of the reasons why I find these little symbols so helpful to have turned on, right? These are my non-printing characters, is because it's going to show me where, first of all, like what's creating a space in my file? If I don't have this turned on and I come into this document and there's a whole bunch of space here, I don't really know what's created that space, right? I just see this big empty space. If I turn on these non-printing characters, I can see, oh, all right, well, somebody went to town here with a hard return, that's the enter key. These little dots all mean somebody hit the space bar a whole bunch of times. And these little arrows mean somebody hit the tab key a whole bunch of times. That's what that tells me. So it's really easy for me just to come in here, select these, get rid of them, and I've removed that space. Pretty easy. But what happens oftentimes, I'm gonna remove this for a second. Okay, I'm gonna create a little bit of space. And now you come into this space and you want to add some new text above here. So this is new text that I'm writing. And uh-oh, what happened? All of a sudden, it's showing up in this centered, bold, all this stuff that's going on. If I had these turned on, I would have known before I started typing that I was going to end up typing text that was formatted in a very particular way because the hard return from up here carried this paragraph marker down saying, oh, I'm going to give you a similar paragraph, Pam. I, I'll give you the same formatting. Here, you go to town, girl. You're all set. That's what Word is trying to do when I hit my enter key. It's going to give me that same formatting for the next line down, which I may or may not want. But oftentimes, people don't have their show hide markers turned on and they won't even see until they start typing and the text comes out in some format they don't expect that of what exactly exactly has occurred here and what's occurred is simply the paragraph formatting and the character formatting because i can actually format this little paragraph marker and it'll it'll hold on to those um uh character formats as well it's actually just carried it down for me Everybody following me on that? Okay, great. So what does this mean? Well, what I can do, for instance, is, I mean, certainly I can highlight this whole line and I can clear it. But what I want to show you is, let's say I take this little marker down here, this guy right here, right? He represents the format that I want for this paragraph. If I select that, and I copy it to my clipboard. And then I select this non-printing character and I paste. Do you see what it did? It actually 
made that little paragraph marker smaller. See that? Okay, now it didn't correct this text in front of it because Word's assuming that, okay, well you wanted, you showed me just this one little paragraph marker. I'm assuming that this is the only thing you want me to change. But I wanted to show you that you actually can change these markers independent of altering the character formatting that exists before it. But you saw what happened is, I'm gonna undo that for a second. You saw when I did that, it removed the paragraph formatting, right? That center alignment, it scooched it right back. Now it didn't alter the character formatting. If I wanted to do both, alter the paragraph and the character formatting, the way that I would have done that is I would have highlighted this paragraph, right? So the text, the characters, I wanna include the characters and the paragraph marker. And I would have utilized this format painter brush one click to pick it up. Now you can see I got a little cute little paintbrush attached to my cursor. Now I'm gonna select this and it's going to copy over all of the formatting, not just the paragraph formatting that was attached to that little marker, but the character formatting of the letters as well. So I managed to update the paragraph and the character formatting by using this little format painter right here versus what I did a minute ago, which is I copied just the paragraph formatting to a different location in the document. And I did that by simply copying this little marker. And you might be thinking to yourself, well, okay, that I guess that's cool, Pam, but why would I ever do that? Uh, a great reason why you might do that, as I mentioned a minute ago, that tabs live with their paragraph marker. And what, I can't tell you how many times I've done this myself and I've seen other people do it, is they'll have tab settings at one place in the document and then want to use them again further down. But those tab settings don't hold because they live in that paragraph where you created them. So if I set up a very particular tab stop in a document, I actually can copy the paragraph marker for that paragraph where those tab stops live and move them to a different part of the document and have those tab stops follow me. So let me show you exactly what I mean by that. I'm gonna do that here. The first thing you need to do, and this is my second pitch. My first pitch was to leave the show hide character markers turned off because they have such valuable information. My second pitch is if you don't have your ruler visible, see my ruler up here? It's gonna live, my ruler is gonna live just below my ribbon. If you're not used to working with your ruler on, you're going to go to the view tab and your ruler is right here. You can turn it on and off. Okay. So I always work with mine turned on. And this is going to give me additional information about what's going on in my document. Okay. So what kind of information is it giving me? Well, if I look, it's, you're not going to be able to see it on my screen. You're probably going to have to look on your own. Um, at every half inch, there is a default tab stop that exists. Okay, so if I hit tab, you can see that I'm gonna move in by a half an inch every time I do it, right? That's what that's telling me. If, let me just set this back for a second. I'm gonna explain what just happened there in a minute. If I want to have my first tab stop be at an inch in instead of half an inch, at the very beginning of my ruler, way over here on the edge, I don't know if you can see it, there's a little button that looks like an L. That is a left aligned tab stop. That's what that is. If I click it, it's gonna change. It's gonna look like an upside down T. That's a center aligned tab stop. Click again, backwards L, that's a right aligned. One more time, it's an upside down T with a dot. That's a decimal aligned tab stop. So when you use those tabs, you're going to be able to align things at a decimal point. And then if I hit it again, it's going to change into some other shapes, like uh, little triangles that represent these markers at the beginning of the ruler, which show my indentation. So I'm going to talk about those in just a second. But if I keep clicking through, you see it's a cycle, right? They cycle all the way through. Now, what does that mean, that little icon, what it shows? It's telling me what kind of tab stop or indentation I have loaded inside of my mouse pointer. 
So if I want to go back to my original example, I said, instead of a half inch, I want to be able, when I hit tab, to move in a full inch. I want that left aligned so I can see it's the right icon, shaped like an L, left aligned. I'm going to move my mouse over to the ruler, and I'm going to click right at the one inch mark. And it's going to leave that little L marker on my ruler. So that's a left aligned tab at the one inch mark, and that's what that's telling me. So when I hit my tab key, do you see how I moved in to perfect, whoops, a second here. I moved in perfect alignment at the one inch mark at that tab stop. Follow me so far? Okay, so that's how I could set a custom tab stop and that's how I can use it. Now, if I want to apply that tab again on the paragraph just below it, if I click in that paragraph, keep your eye on my ruler. Okay, so keep your eye up here. When I click in that next paragraph, uh-oh, where'd my tab go? Well, the tab uh, was applied to just this paragraph because tab settings are paragraph formats. I had my insertion point inside of only this paragraph. So when I set that custom marker, it only applied it to this one singular paragraph. Okay. If... I pick up and copy this marker now, go to my home tab, I'm going to copy it. And I select the paragraph marker down below and I paste it. If you look, look at that, it's on the ribbon now, so that when I hit tab at the beginning of this paragraph, automatically it's going to line up with the one above it. Make sense? Okay, now this is not the way I would apply tab stops to more than one paragraph, okay? This is what I would do if I applied it to one paragraph and realized, uh-oh, I need this on multiple paragraphs. So if it's sort of, I'm doing it sort of after the fact. If I know before the fact that I want this paragraph, that I want this tab stop in front of more than one paragraph, what I would do, and I'm gonna undo this, and I'm gonna get rid of all of them, what I would do is I would highlight those multiple paragraphs and then I would go up and apply the tab stop so that when I came back down and executed hitting the tab key, they're all gonna move into that tab point. If you wanted this for the entire document, you could simply select the entire document, right? And I know I can do that with the keyboard shortcut control A, I can quickly select my whole document. And then I can simply come up here and apply the tab on the ribbon. And now, no matter where I go in the document, when I hit that tab, I'm automatically going to move it a full inch because I set it for the entire document, meaning I selected every single paragraph marker there was by using Control A. And then when I add it to the ribbon, it's going to affect everybody that's selected, which is the whole document. Make sense? Okay. All right, so what do I do if I don't want that tab anymore, right? I'm done with it. Or I've come into a document that I inherited from somebody else and it has tab stops all over the place and it's making me mental because every time I try to hit the tab and I'm expecting to only move in half an inch, I'm going into all these crazy settings. If that's the scenario in which you find yourself, it is so easy to get rid of tabs. All you're gonna do is move your mouse up to the ruler Choose the marker you want to get rid of, drag it off the ruler, and just let it go. Just let it go. That's all you have to do. Now, it is not going to remove, however, your execution of hitting the tab key on your keyboard. That's what I see left over here, right? I still have that tab space, but it's no longer happening at the one inch mark. But there will always be default tabs that exist at every half inch. You can't get rid of those, right? Word needs to know what to do when you hit the tab key. Can't do nothing. So by default, it's going to move in half an inch. So if I wanted to get rid of this altogether, this would be removing the non-printing character, which I would do simply with a backspace or delete keystroke, depending on where my cursor was, right? So there's two things when you're get rid of, getting rid of tabs. You can get rid of the custom marker that exists on the ruler, but you may also need to get rid of the actual execution of the keystroke hitting simply by using um, backspace or delete. And it's easy to figure out what you're deleting when you have these non-printing characters turned on, right? 
I mean, I certainly can get rid of an empty space without them turned on, but I don't really know what I just deleted. This will tell me exactly what it was I just deleted. Okay, how are we doing? Everybody okay so far? Okay, great. Fantastic, okay. So I talked a little bit about the non-printing characters. We talked about using the ruler. This is just a reminder that you can get rid of paragraph formats using that same clear all function. I do want to talk a little bit about page breaks and where paragraphs will fall when you get naturally to the end of uh, a page, right? So when text is going to start to move on to page two, three, and so on. So for this, I'm going to go to a document that's a little bit longer than the one I just showed you. We're going to go back to this one. Okay. So let's say, whoops. Let's say this is a good example right here. Section two is pretty close to the end of this page. And maybe I would prefer not to have this text uh, you know, sort of abandoned uh, on its own on, 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 on the page up here. I want it to all go freshly onto a new page. There's a couple different ways I can do that. The way that I don't want you to ever, ever do it, which I suspect uh, probably none of you do, but I don't ever want to see you doing something like where you just keep hitting the enter key until you get it to go onto the right page. The reason why I don't want you to do it this way is because if you go back up, up above, and you start to add a whole bunch of more text up here, right? I'm just going to, what's going to happen is you're going to end up with these weird holes in your text because those hard returns that you use to get that text to go to the next line, they're going to float with it, right? So that's really not the cleanest, most efficient way to do this. The cleanest, most efficient way to do it, and here's a good example, right? So my section two is stuck up here by itself, is to go to the paragraph section of your ribbon, and you're going to hit the little notch in the corner. This is called the dialog box launcher, and this takes you into the comprehensive dialog box where all of your paragraph formats are. Fonts have one for characters as well, this guy right here. These are all collectively called dialog box launchers. And I'm going to execute the one for paragraph. And here you're going to see some fairly typical uh, paragraph formats, right? You can change the alignment, the indentation, before and after spacing, line spacing. You can even set tabs in here. So there's a dialog box where you can set tabs. Um, personally, I find it significantly easier to set them on the ribbon. And that's been my experience as well with uh, all the students I've trained. It's a little bit more intuitive to do it on the ribbon versus trying to do it in this dialog box. But what I want to talk about is this tab of the dialog box that a lot of people don't often explore. And it's got some really, really powerful things that can help you. Now, by default, as part of your normal style, widow and orphan control is turned on. What that means is the very, very first line of a full paragraph or the very, very last line will not be stranded on a page all by their lonesome. Okay, so no widows, no orphans. But this is a little bit of a different scenario I've got going on here, right? This is a full and discrete paragraph unto itself. And we know that because I just told you that word considers a paragraph any amount of text that precedes one of these paragraph markers. So there's nothing to strand here, even though clearly this title has been stranded from its associated paragraph text down below. In a situation like this, you want to use the command keep with next. So what this is good for, keep with next, is any little titles like this will automatically move to the next page if their paragraph, their next, their first paragraph goes to the next page, you'll never strand little headers all by themselves at the bottom of a, uh, of a page. That's what keep with next does. So if I say, okay, automatically it moved that down to the next page. Now it didn't put in a page break. 
So it, there's not going to be any problem if you type up above. You're not going to end up with an errant page break in the middle somewhere. It's just intuitively paying attention to where the end of the page is and making sure that this text follows its full paragraph below it. So that was using the little dialog box launcher here. Line and page break, keep with next. You can also choose keep lines together. Now, why might you use something like that? In this scenario, it wouldn't make sense, but let's say, I'm gonna, I know I have an example right here. Let's say I've got this uh, product price list here and I don't want the page to break in the middle of it. And I'm actually gonna use a little instructor trick. This is gonna quickly just create a bunch of fake text for me. Okay, so you see how now this is breaking in a weird way. It's going to split the table. I don't want it to, to be like this, right? I need all of this to go together. Otherwise, it's going to be confusing for somebody to read. All I'm going to do is select all of these lines. And if I go to that little dialog box launcher, and I'm going to click on the second tab, line and page breaks, I'm going to choose keep lines together. And when I click OK, Whoops, I don't know why that didn't move. I think I've got something up above that's preventing it. But basically what'll happen is all of those will go together as a piece when you're using this guy right here. You can also choose page break before. So that's a little different because that does actually put in a, a page break. But what that will do is it will allow me, so if I come here, I'll do the same thing. We're going to choose page break before. And it's going to automatically move everybody down and put in the break up above. So question from Kurt. Thanks, Kurt. Can you apply keep with next in a style? You totally can with a style. 100%, definitely. Um, or do you have to select it for each of those section titles? Nope, I do not at all. So that, hold that thought, Kurt, and I'm going to show you exactly where to do that as soon as we talk about styles, which is coming next. So I'll make sure that I, I, I'll call out exactly where that is. So this little dialog box right here, line and page breaks, can really help you make sure that the flow of your text is happening in the way that you want. Now, another great example, and I don't actually think, I probably should have pulled up a file that has this, but I, I think I can just describe it to you. Oftentimes what happens is we will have a table, right? Where you'll have text on a table that will move to the next page. You can actually use keep with next or keep lines together to make sure that you don't have a table in Word that breaks in an awkward way. So that's one way you can make sure you don't act accidentally end up having a bunch of rows that move on to the next page and so on. This is the tool you're going to want to use for that. Sound good? OK, excellent. Well, I can't believe it's 4 o'clock already, but it's 4 o'clock already. Uh, so what I'd like to do is just give us a little uh, chance to break for, I'm going to try to make it super quick because I, I don't have a ton of time with you. Um, so if anybody needs a bio break or you would like to, um, you know, refill your water glass, why don't we shoot for a quick like five or six minute break? Um, and in the meantime, I, I'm going to stay right here because I don't, I don't need a break. And if anybody has any questions about anything I just covered uh, and you also don't need a bio break, come off mic and, and fire away. And if anybody goes to the bathroom, it's being recorded so you can catch what you need. <laughs> Thank you so much. I don't have a question, but I've been using Word an awfully long time. <laughs> and you just covered things I had never even thought were possible. So. Oh, good. Oh, that's yeah, great. Thank you. 
That's great. Yeah. And I think, you know, and as I was approaching this and I, I was, you know, and I talked to Brittany yesterday about kind of what people do and the skill level and, and, you know, kind of where you're coming at this from that bit of understanding the different types of formatting and the way word approaches documents that mindset alone will help you troubleshoot your files. So if you can remember those three ways, it can really, really help along with, you know, knowing where your show hide markers are so you can see what's going on. I love the show hide. That's my favorite. It's one of my favorite features, but. Well, I that's because you and I are old word yeah, perfect I people, right? <laughs> I, I still miss reveal codes. I'm, I'm not over it. You gotta have that on. Almost all my documents keep that on all the time. <laughs> Me too. Yeah. Yeah, I have another document over here that has them on. I always jokingly say, like, you know, I'll have sometimes people say, well, I, I can't, I, I have a hard time reading the document. It gets in the way. I don't, you know, it, it, it muddies things up. And they'll say, how do you work with them on? And I always um, make a, a Matrix joke, right? If you've ever seen the movie The Matrix and they, the guy's watching all the code flash by and he says, you know, I don't, I don't even see it. I just see blonde, brunette, redhead. And it's the same thing. I don't you get to the point where you use them you don't see them they be they're just there and you they don't they don't matter no i have seen the little square mark that appeared when you did the uh, keep in line and keep with next and i did not i knew it was a mark like i knew it was a marker indicating something was applied but yes. i did not know what that was indicating and so i've never been able to like what is what is that doing i don't know yeah that's and that's an important one i'm so glad you called that out carrie because i meant to make mention of that dot and i i forgot to circle back and say it yeah that's a also a non-printing character and, and it's an important one because these features these line break features they can they can really like flummox you if all of a sudden in the middle of your document there's like a random page break but you don't have the break that you can erase you know you can't see that line so it's like what is going on what's causing this that little dot is your cue to come here to this line and page breaks tab and remove whatever formatting is applied there that's what's creating your weird space i see i just use the clear formatting because i never i never knew like what that was indicating yeah. and rather than go hunting i just clear the formatting and start over but I, yeah I and that's i mean that's a that's a perfectly great way to do it but it's a little bit like throwing the baby out with the bath water because then you gotta Absolutely add everything back in that you wanted to keep. Yes. Um, yes. Loretta, thanks for your question. Struggling with styles lately. I apply one and it changes everything in that style throughout the document, even though I have it in a table, maybe breaks need to be applied. So question Loretta, and you can feel free to come off mic if you want, Loretta, if you have, if you have a microphone ability, if you don't, that's fine. We can keep text chatting. Um, but Tell me a little bit more about that because that shouldn't, what you just described shouldn't occur. So I think I need to have a better conceptual understanding of what's going on there. Can you hear me well? I can. Okay. Um, so I've been working with a new group and so they had a template um, that I've been for a meeting, meeting agenda and meeting notes. I've been adapting it to work better flow wise. So I actually created a table for all the agenda items within a Word document. Yeah. Um, and so I have things labeled as 1.1, 1 .1, you know, 1.2. So I created styles for that. So that way it's easy to number. But then when I bring it in one level, like start like A, B, C, or like I, you know, I, I, um, and I apply it throughout, even though I might want it in a different color to signify one thing as an agenda item, one thing as notes, it it bolds everything or it, it, it applies it to the whole thing and I can control Z and it'll undo, but I don't, I don't understand why it does it to begin with. Um, so I don't know if there's something I didn't do correctly. I'm not real familiar with styles, but I'm trying to learn um, to make it easier for for all these meetings and, and notes that they're needing for for this. So I think, uh, so first of all, I'm going to tell you, I can't tell you uh, exactly right now what it is that's been set incorrectly, but I think you're right. There's something that has been applied incorrectly. So Word is sort of aggressively over giving you formatting that you don't want. Um, mm -hmm. What I'm going to say, Loretta, is uh, 
the, um, I'm just going to throw it in, into the chat right now. This is my email address. If you can send me a version of that, that I can take a look at, I'm very happy to go take a peek in that and, uh, and tell you what it is we need to fix, but I'm going to need to see it in order to tell you what we need to fix. That would be great. I appreciate it. Thank you yeah. so much. Absolutely. And it, Cause it won't take me long. I will just, uh, I just need to look at it quickly and I'll be able to tell you exactly what it is. Okay. Okay. Uh, all right. So I think probably everybody's back. I want to keep moving because uh, honestly, I could talk about this all day. So there's a ton of things I can share with you, but I want to, um, I want to talk a little bit about paragraph style. That's where we left off. Okay, great. So I'm going to actually switch back to a, just this shorter document that is a little bit more manageable for us. And I'm going to quickly control A and remove all my formatting, take us back to ground zero. And we're going to talk a little bit about paragraph styles. So paragraph styles are essentially just a cluster of formats that have been given a name that you can then apply to the current or future documents simply by selecting the name of that style. This is how easy it is. So I know this is my title, so I'm going to choose the style called title. This is sort of a first level heading, so I'm going to go to my little style box right here, and I'm going to choose, this is heading one, we can't see the one, but it's there, heading one. This is a second level heading, that's going to be heading two. This will also be heading two, so you can see what I'm doing here, right? Heading two, beautiful. Summary, we'll call that a heading one. And then the price list, we'll make a heading two. So you can see how I quickly was able to come in here and apply these formats and have, I'm gonna turn off my show hide markers quickly and have a pretty decent looking stylized document. Okay, so these styles that I use, none of them that I use here are custom made. You can custom make them. These all came as part of the normal template, but I can, format these parts of the normal template. So in other words, if I like this heading one style, but oh, I don't really want it to be blue, I don't know about the blue shading, the easiest way to modify a style is to take one example of it and make the changes that you want, let's say we'll do uh, orange and bold, and I want them left aligned. So make the changes that you want in the document on one example of it. While leaving that example selected, come back up to the little styles window here and right mouse click on the name of the style. So this is heading one, so I right mouse clicked on the heading one style. And at the very top, it says update heading one to match selection. Why, yes, that's exactly what I'd like to do, Word. And when I choose that and I scroll down, boom, there we go. Summary is automatically updated. So for every instance of heading one in this document, it would automatically update it based on that change I made. So let me do it again. I'm going to do it with heading two. I'm going to select an example of my heading two. We'll do left align, and maybe what we'll do is like a half inch indent, and we'll do a little italicizing. Okay. So once I have that the way I want, I'm going to come up to my style box. I'm going to find that heading. This was heading two. Right mouse click, update heading two to match selection. And when I scroll through, you can see all my heading twos have been updated. Pretty cool. Okay, so now I wanna circle back and Kurt, I wanna uh, talk about your specific question about the keep with next. So certainly I could have in my selection here, I could have left that selected. I could have come in, um, selected line in page breaks. Actually, you can see that it's already turned on by default, um, but I could turn that on or turn that off from here and I could still do it the same way, right mouse click. But there is another way to modify your styles as well. So if I right mouse click on heading two, there is a modify command. This is gonna bring up a dialog box that's gonna allow me to make modifications to this beyond just copying the formatting that I have. So certainly you can see this sort of mimics the ribbon. I can change my font, my color, all of that good stuff. But if I look down at the bottom 
the format button that pulls up formatting specifically for fonts, paragraphs, borders, numbering. Um, so Loretta, the, your style had numbering in it. This is actually where I could modify the numbering style for, uh, for a style if I wanted to. Okay. So then I could come in here and in this case, um, Kurt, it was lines and par um, line and page breaks for paragraph formatting. And I could either turn these on or off based on what I wanted and click OK. Pretty good. So far, so good. Excellent. Now, these modifications that I've made currently only exist for this document. And how do I know that? Because this modify style dialog box tells me it's only happening in this document. If I made changes to these styles and these were, let's say, I don't know, like the branding colors of my company. So I know that I want this to be available to me every time I start a new document in Word. I can make the changes to these styles here in this document and then choose the option of new documents based on this template. And since I base this off the normal template, right? I just did file new, boom, white, you know, brand new document. I didn't use any special custom template. If I choose this, the changes I just made will be available to me in every default new document I make going forward. Okay. So that is not ever on by default. That is something you have to pick, uh, but it is available to you in this dialog box. Make sense? Great. Now you can also, and I'm not gonna go too deep into this simply because uh, of time issue, but you can create your own styles from scratch. So there certainly are a lot of styles here, but if you wanted to build one uh, for yourself, um, you maybe use a lot of bulleted lists and you have a particular way you like your bulleted lists to look, you could create a brand new style. Okay, so I could call this, my caps lock it, I could call it bullets. Okay, I could modify it. I'm gonna modify it by, uh, I'm to my paragraph. I could choose spacing, alignment, so on set up everything I want. And then when it's all done, I'll simply click OK. And now I'll actually have a brand new style here for bullets. Okay, so you can also build your own. Everybody good with that? Okay. All right, document formats. Gonna get to the third and final part of formatting in Word. With document formats, uh, we actually have to section off the document. Otherwise, any changes we make are going to get applied to the entire thing. That is the number one thing you have to remember with document formats. So let me pull up a file here. Okay, so here's a fairly long document. It's got a bunch of things in it. And let's say that what I would really like is I want... Let's say this section right here, the stakeholder involvement, I want this to be in columns, like newspaper style columns, okay? So that's an option that I have. It's part of the layout tab. I could choose columns here, but this is considered a section or a document format. So if I were to come here and choose columns and say, I want two columns and select that, what just happened is it did it to my entire document. See that? The whole thing, which it's not what I wanted. So I'm gonna undo that. The way that I would set this up, if I wanted this only for this stakeholder piece, is I am gonna click at the beginning of this section, okay? And I'm gonna go up to the breaks tab, or sorry, the breaks button, which is on the layout tab. And I am going to choose continuous. So what this is going to allow me to do is make a break right here. And I'm going to come down. I'm just going to do a, just a tiny section. I'm just going to come to the end of this paragraph. And I'm going to insert another continuous break. Okay. If I turn on my show hide markers, you can actually see the break lines. See this dotted section here and this dotted section here that actually is the, um, the section breaks. 
Now, as long as my insertion point is flashing somewhere in between those two dotted break lines, I can go back to layout, I can go to columns, I can say two, and look at that. Only that one little section now is broken into columns. Okay, so I love using columns as the example of how section formats work because it's really obvious right away. But this is the exact same way that watermarks work, headers and footers, page orientation, all of that. So let's look at another example. Here's a lovely little table right here. Let's say that, uh, I'm just gonna make a couple of changes to this, let's say. We're going to add some columns. All right, we're running into a situation here where this table's getting really wide, probably going to be better in a, a landscape orientation. In this case, I need to do that for a whole page because you can't just have, think about it from a printing perspective, right? You can't have one page where just a portion of it is longer and the other pieces of the page above and below are portrait. That's not going to work. Your printer's not going to know what to do with that. But if I make this its own page by going up to breaks, and I say that I want this section break to start on the next page, what it's gonna do is it's gonna push that table down onto a new page, okay? And I'm gonna do the same thing after it. I'm gonna go to break and I'm gonna say next page. So what I just did first and foremost is I put this table on its own piece of paper. That's the very first thing I need to do. Now that it's on its own piece of paper, as long as I'm on the table or somewhere in this section, I can go back up to layout, I can go to orientation, and I can say, make this one landscape. So now I've got all this room here for this table to grow as wide as I need it to be, nice and clean and easy to read. But if I scroll up, the page before it is still portrait. If I scroll down, the page after it is still portrait. Make sense? So the trick is when you want to do something that typically would affect the entire document, and you don't want that, you only want it to affect one little piece, you're going to section that piece off. And you're either going to section it off continuously if you want it happening on the same eight and a half by 11 piece of paper, or you're going to section it off with page breaks before and after that define that section. Once you do that, you can then go into that section and make all these modifications that you want. Make sense? Okay, so one more thing I wanna show you with that, I wanna uh, talk about headers and footers because this is sort of the area that gives everybody a little bit of angst. Your headers and footers sometimes can feel like they do their own thing regardless of whatever you're doing. So typically, headers and footers are something that you want consistent across the entire document, except when you don't. So let me uh, start by just going in and um, adding some headers and footers. So I'm going to go to insert, and I'm going to insert a header. And I'm going to choose to edit the header. I'm just going to jump right into the header section. And I'm going to uh, put, let's see, I'll put... Uh, proposal. And if you look at your ruler for your header and footer, there always will be tab settings on your ruler. At the middle point, this is a center aligned tab so that you can line things up centered exactly in the middle of your header. And this is a right aligned tab. So if I wanted, for instance, uh, maybe over here at the right to have, I don't know, maybe the company website, for example. Okay. And then if I'm going to go to my footer, there's actually a button up here on the special header and footer ribbon to go to the footer. And down here, I'm going to do a center align tab and I'm just going to insert uh, just a simple page number. Okay. All right. So far, so good. So I'm going to close out of this. And if I scroll out a little bit. I don't care if you can't read it. I just want to show you that my header and footer now are showing up 
in the document. But look at this. It's already doing weirdness. Like it's not on this one. Okay, but it is here. And then, but it's not here. See what I got going on here? The page number's on this page, but not on this page. Anybody ever have um, documents that do this to you? Only yeah. all the time. Only all the time. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So how do we diagnose this? Well, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to jump back into the header and the footer. And what, let me just zoom in a little bit. I don't even know. If I'm, I don't even know if you guys are going to be able to see this. You might, yeah, I don't think it's going to get big enough. You're going to have to uh, just bear with me on this. And, and, and what I'm really looking at is this little marker right here. And what you can't see, but I can, is this says header section six. This tells me there are multiple sections in this document, okay? Now, sometimes when you inherit a document or you're working with a legacy document, you're not gonna know that there are sections that are already in there. So you go innocently to add a header or a footer and all of a sudden it's not showing up where you expect it to because you didn't realize there were already these sections that exist. So what do we do in this instance? Well, this is a couple of things we're gonna look to diagnose for, okay? We are gonna look to see if different odd and even pages are turned on. That's true, you wanna turn that off. The second thing we're gonna look at is how many sections there really are. And the trick is then to use these previous and next buttons, okay? Because what you want to do is, first of all, figure out how many sections do I have? So what this is telling me is not only do I have section six, but section six thinks it needs its own different first page. We don't need that. So what I'm going to do, I can see this as first page header sec section six right here. I'm going to remove different first page. Okay. So now I just have header six. I'm going to keep going back. This is a header section five. This is, uh, again, first page for header section five. So what you want to do, and I'm going to, I'm going to actually go all the way back to the beginning. Your best bet in a situation like this, go all the way to the beginning of the file. So section one has a different first page header, title page. That makes sense. I want to keep that. So I'm going to leave that as is. I'm going to go next. So now this is header one. But do you notice how header one is empty? Okay, I've got this here. So chances are I don't want this information on my first page header. So I'm going to get rid of that there. I really want it here. So I'm going to put that here. There we go. That's my header section one. So far, so good. I'm going to go next. Okay. Oops. Header section one. Get rid of the other ones. Honestly, I don't know why this is so tiny. It's so small on my screen. I can barely see it at the moment. Okay, so I'm now in section two. I managed to get over here to section two. Sorry about that. It's so difficult to see. I apologize. Like I said, I can barely see it on my screen for some reason. Um, now what I'm looking at, so I finished section one. Section one looks great. Okay, I've got my header and footer. Actually, I can put my footer back in. My footer fell out. So I'm just going to put in my page number. Okay, there's my page number. So now I'm here in section three. My header looks great, right? That's exactly what I want my header to be. But I want you to notice there's another little flag on this corner, okay? This little flag reads same as previous. If I wanted this section to have a header that said something other than what it does, it's copying it from the previous section, I can remove the link to previous. This is what throws people off. When you have multiple sections, by default, this new section is always going to look at the previous section to figure out what it should put in the header or footer. If you don't want that, what I always say is you got to poke its eyes out, right? You got to remove this little button right here. Don't let it look back. 
and then you can change it to something entirely different or vice versa, right? You you come to a new section and the header doesn't appear. Like, where's the header? Why is it not there? Probably because it's not linked to the previous. You're expecting it's going to carry that header through. But for some reason, it's not looking at the previous section. So if you turn this off, I just turned it off. I could now delete this. Okay. I deleted it. But if I go back to the preceding section, it's still held from the preceding section. I was able to delete it just from this section. If I want it back, I'm just going to choose link to previous. Whoops. I said link to previous. And it's automatically going to pull that text forward for me. Does that make sense? This, I will tell you from experience, is probably the most confusing thing Word does. Okay. So I think the thing to remember here is that if you want changes in your headers and footers, you have to create different sections. If you have a header or footer that is not showing what the previous section is, make sure it's linked. This is probably where things are going wrong. It's either linked and it shouldn't be, or it needs to be linked and it's not. The best thing I always tell people to do, if the headers and footers get really cuckoo crazy for you, Start at the beginning, delete all of them, and then go back and start to add them from page one all the way through to the end, enter in exactly what you want, and link where they need to be linked. 99 times out of 100, that's actually faster than trying to unravel which section has what header and footer, does it have a different first page, so on and so forth. The easiest thing sometimes to do is just to delete all of them. And then starting at the very beginning, go back in and add the headers and footers. Okay, you with me so far? All right. That's a hard concept to grasp in the middle of the afternoon after lunch. Like I said, it's the <laughs> toughest one. But mostly what I want you to remember, sections and link to previous. If you remember those two things, those are where things generally fall apart with headers and footers. Okay. So I want to talk a little bit about working with tables. So I want to talk about some things we can insert now into documents um, and some of the benefits and ways we can utilize these things. So I'm going to actually call up another document here. Okay. okay. So this is just a... a contract document. I'm going to use an example below in just a second. To insert a table, super easy to do, right? I can simply go over to insert. I can choose table. You can show it how many columns and rows you want, or you can do it out of a dialog box, whichever way you want, right? Pretty much pretty, everybody probably knows how to do this, right? Build a table. Um, I think you probably know that the tab key will move you from cell to cell in the table. And it will also, if you're in the final cell of the table and you hit tab, automatically adds a new row. So you don't even ever have to be specific about how many rows you need. You can just quickly do it that way. OK, so some of the things that I think people run afoul of in tables from time to time are when I want to uh, resize a table, right? I can simply drag this borderline, right? And I can resize this. Sometimes that's difficult for people to do. If that is the case for you, like trying to, you know, exactly find that dividing line and grab it. If your rib, uh, ruler is turned on, remember I can do that under view ruler. These little waffle sections represent the column borders. And sometimes those are easier to find and pick up and drag. So that oftentimes can be a little bit easier for manipulation if you can see those. Now, one of the things that I think is incredibly cool about what we can do with tables is if you select an individual cell and then I go and drag one of these borders, it's going to affect only that cell, right? So I can actually create, I hate that little guy keeps popping back up on me. 
this actually is going to allow me, if I have the cell selected, to make that cell bigger or smaller than the others inside of its same row. Okay. Now, sometimes this happens accidentally and you can't quite get it back. Have you ever done that where you're trying to get it back exactly right and you it's just a little bit to the left or a little bit to the right. You can't exactly line it up perfectly. I don't know if that's ever happened. There is a trick for fixing it. The trick is if you select the whole column and then you jiggle it, whoops, come here. You can actually get it back. There we go. So if you select either the whole one or even just two of them is sufficient. So if you've got one that's off, right? As long as I select two of them, I can get them back perfectly. So that's just a good little hack trick for you with uh, dealing with tables. So I had mentioned before that if I need to, that I don't really use tabs, right? I said, I, I, I don't, I don't bother with them. That if I need to align things, I'll typically do it in a table. Now, oftentimes people think, well, I don't want to do that because I don't want, I don't want lines. Like I just want the information. Well, you don't actually have to show the lines in a table. So um, uh, let me just do something quickly here. I'll just do three columns, get rid of these quickly. I'm going to right click and just choose delete columns. All right, so this is just going to. All right, so we got a little bit of a working table here. Uh, I actually can move the table around with this little um, arrow in the corner, so it actually allows me to to move my table, these four headed arrows, which is really, really helpful. When I'm in the table, I have two tabs, design tab and the layout tab. So I said that I use this in lieu of tabs. I can easily still do the center alignment tab by using just center alignment inside the column and so on. So any of those sort of aligned tab things I can do, like if I wanted something right aligned, I've got right alignment options here. So all of that I can do with tabs, I can do inside of a table. And if I don't want the lines to appear, I'm simply gonna select the table and I can either use the line uh, borders option here or I can do it on the design tab. You'll see it in both places. I'm just gonna choose no border. Okay, and if you look at that, this looks exactly like what it would look like if I had used tab stops, but it's a million times easier to use and manipulate, right? So just don't show those lines. Now, if I turn on, just quickly to show you this, my show hide characters, you're going to get these little uh, fuzzy circles they sort of look like. That's a visual cue that tells me this is made in a table. That's what that says. So those indicate the end of each cell. And I've got two of them over here because the other one indicates the end of the row. That's what that tells me. So the two doubled up here. So that I'll be able to see with my show hide characters turned on. There also is under the layout tab, a button here called view grid lines. That's gonna put in really fine little wispy lines. They're non-printing. Those are not actually going to show if you print it. They're just helpful for you while you're working so you can see where the lines are, are, or the demarcation is between the columns and the rows. Okay, let's view grid lines. Good so far? All right. I'm going to show you my favorite way to use this. So if I scroll down a little bit here, uh, we've got some we've got some signature blocks. So this is a pretty good looking signature block, right? Kind of handsome, looks pretty decent. The problem with this signature block is the problem that I encounter in most signature blocks I see, which is if I come here and I wanna start putting in my information, oh gosh, right? It's all gonna start moving and then my name isn't underlined. So I gotta come back and I gotta add an underline and then I gotta delete all this garbage here. And then what did look pretty good now looks kind of miserable. 
I do feel your pain, Karen. Yes. Okay. I am going to show you another way to do this. So if I scroll down here in my second option, I did this using tables. So I built a table. You can see that I have one empty column in between. That's going to create this little reservoir that we see up here, right? I have uh, some uh, rows here that I can type in. But if I turn off, let me go to my, my view grid lines. All right, here we go. So this looks exactly like up above, except because I did it in a table, if I type here, oh, the joy and the bliss of it, right? I can type whatever I want. I'm just using my tab key to move around, right? Everything is going to look beautiful and work perfectly. And I did that simply by building this inside of a table. And the only thing I did is I just added uh, borders to the bottom of these specific cells. So that's all I did. So I just, I'm gonna turn the grid lines back on so you can see, okay? So uh, you can see where all of the demarcation lines are. And all I did is I just clicked in each of these cells and I went up to table design and I went to my borders and I just said bottom border, boom, you're good to go. Pretty cool. Yeah, I uh, I make it my mission in life to go through my company and every time I see somebody <laughs> build a contract or a proposal or anything that doesn't have signature blocks you can actually type in, I immediately correct it. I just don't know how I went through 20 years not knowing this. <laughs> and the cool thing is, I mean, you could even write, I mean, if you wanted to create a form that was going to have like irregular lines, because we know that I can select an individual cell, I could have things that had varying lengths. So, you know, think about it. If you had like first name, last name, address, city, state, zip, you could do all of that in a table where each cell was a different size and just underline or just put borders on the bottoms of the cells where you wanted people to type. And it becomes a completely usable and typeable, typeable table that looks exactly like a form. All right, good deal. Um, so we already did this. We already talked about long documents and the page orientation. So we covered that, but I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, working with graphics. Um, I know that did come up in a couple of things. Do, do some of you insert like pictures, images, other kinds of things like that? Also, that's something that pictures that are, you know, snips or, you know, JPEG. Or yep. Yeah. Yeah, yep, absolutely. So it doesn't really matter the source of it, where it comes from, whether it is a photograph that you, you know, downloaded from your phone or a digital camera. It's an image you found on the internet. It's something you copy and paste in. Word kind of doesn't care where it comes from. It treats everybody the same. So here's a document where I am going to go and I'm going to insert under my insert tab. I'm going to go to the pictures tab and you can either uh, grab things from your device. So things that are either connected to your computer or that you have stored on your computer. Stock images are just images that uh, come with your word license. And then online pictures allows you to search the internet for images as well. So if you're not getting any love here under stock images, you can always search online, but I'm just gonna go to my stock images and I'm gonna grab, that's a pretty image. I'll just grab that flower. All right. So I dropped in this uh, beautiful little image of a flower here. Uh, first and foremost, if you want to resize this image, Always resize using corner handles because it will allow you to scale height and width equally. If you use the middle handles, you're going to distort the image. So that's where you get the squishy factor from. Uh, never use the middle handles. Always use the corner and you're going to scale height and width at the same time. So this is probably what has happened for a lot of you. You drop in an image and it kind of splices up your text, right? It just kind of like clunks in wherever it is. 
That's why this little arch icon right here is so important. It's going to control the flow of the text around your image. You will also see that icon on the picture format tab. So you'll see it right here, wrap text. And these options allow you to determine how the text is going to react to the image. By default, it's going to be inline, which means it's literally like any other text that you might type. It's going to flow with the document. It's going to move with the text. This is going to allow the text to flow around me. See how nice that looks already, right? Ooh, look at that. It's so satisfying. Okay. So that's a square. There are other options. There's tight. Tight is simply going to create less of a buffer space between the image and the text. There's also this one right here, which is through. Through is not going to matter for mine because mine is a square that has solid filling in it. But if you had an image that was um, maybe like a logo or something like that, that um, had a lot of white space, you could have the text flow into that white space. Okay, you also have it in front and behind. So if you want to put text over it, you can do that. And then this is essentially to, um, create space above and below. But these allow you to determine how the text is going to react. These two down here are important, and a lot of people miss these. So by default, move with text is going to be on. Now, move with text is important because when I have this image selected, do you also see this little uh, Popeye anchor over here? Almost looks like, oh, I always jokingly say it looks like my document got a tattoo. That image or that little marker right there tells me that this picture is anchored to this paragraph. Remember we said paragraphs are any amount of text that exists before that hard return. So because this is anchored to this paragraph, if I add more text above this paragraph, the picture is going to go with it, right? So it's going to flow as a piece. This picture is anchored to this paragraph. But I could say, I don't care about the paragraph. This picture needs to stay here in relationship to the page, right? I want the picture of this flower to always be on this spot, on this page. I don't care about the text. So what that does is that allows, you know, even as things change or move, this picture is going to remain in this location. Okay. So that's what these two are here. And keep in mind, I have seen this happen before. You can move the anchor. So I can actually pick up this anchor and I can drag it down to this paragraph. So that becomes re really confusing because it means that this picture is now going to flow in relationship to this paragraph. So wherever this second paragraph goes, this picture is going to come in the same relative position with that paragraph. So if somebody's done that accidentally, you can really pretty much think you've lost your mind. Like, why is it doing that? So just pay attention to where that anchor is. And if you want this picture to go with this paragraph, you're just going to make sure the anchor just moves up to it. Oh, come on, you. There we go. Good. All right, excellent. Um, let me just talk quickly about, I, I think I've got enough time. Hold on one second, let me. Yeah. Okay, oops, I didn't mean to do that. Okay, let me just talk about a couple of other cool things you can do here. One of them is you can, with a picture, if I go to picture format, I can crop a picture. This can be really powerful because sometimes you have a picture you found or one that you have elsewhere and it's got a bunch of extraneous stuff or you don't have enough room on the page. It's taking up too much space. If I click on the crop tab, it's going to give me these little black handles around the edge and I can use those to come in and cut off basically the pieces of the picture I don't need displayed. And when I click away, you can see the picture has been contracted to just that shape. Now, those parts of the picture didn't go anywhere. They're still there. We're just hiding them on you. 
If I click the picture again and under picture format, go to the reset picture tab, I can send it back to, whoops, go away. I can send it back to the default. Doing that. Whoops. I don't know why it's not resetting my picture. I don't know what I just did. Okay, in my haste, I did something weird. It's not resetting my picture. But basically, all you should have to be able to do is hit that reset set picture, and it'll actually um, remove the cropping on it for you. Let's see if we do one more thing. I can uh, maybe get it to force the reset. The other thing you can do that's kind of cool is you do have these other options like artistic effects. You know, if you wanted to, uh, if you have a picture or an image that you know isn't going to match based on its colors or whatever, you could change it into something stylized. You can change the colors if you wanted. So you could create, you know, this sort of nice black and white effect if you don't have a color printer, for instance. The other thing you can do that I think is kind of cool is you can remove the background of an image. Let's say I only want this flower petal, these flowers. I don't care about all this other junk. I can choose to remove the background. And what Word is going to do is it's going to recognize or try to recognize what it sees as the foreground and the background. Probably not going to get it perfect, but it came pretty close. So what I have the ability to do now is mark areas I want to keep and mark areas I want to remove. So I can see it's missing some of this petal. So I'm going to mark that as an area to keep just by picking up that pencil and then clicking on the areas I wanted to keep. See that? Now it added some extra flowers up here I don't want. I'm going to click on mark areas to remove. I get the same little pencil, but now when I click, it's going to remove those areas. Pretty cool. Now when I'm done, I'm going to keep my changes. Boom, look at that. Okay, and now you can see the difference with uh, tight versus square, right? There's tight versus square. Okay, so that can give you a better look at it. Pretty cool. Now what I should, I'm sorry, go ahead. You're a graphic designer too. Yeah, I know, right? And then I, I should be able to reset this picture. There we go. So there's what the reset looks like, right? So even if you make those drastic changes, you can always reset and bring it back to what it looked like before as well, which is great. Okay, so I only have uh, 10 minutes. Let me quickly pop back over to PowerPoint. There were just a couple of quick things I wanted to uh, in my little wrap up here, remind you of undo and repeat. We talked a little bit about undo, right? I showed you the undo icon on the quick access toolbar. I said control Z was the keyboard shortcut for it. What I don't think I had a chance to mention was the repeat button. So if you have something you need to do a couple of different times repeated in the document, you can actually either hit this repeat icon or what I usually do is just control Y. So control Y will repeat your last action, whatever that is, which is really helpful. Two really, really helpful keyboard shortcuts. And then the other one is, Brittany, I know uh, you had mentioned uh, that some folks have to be able to bring Word docs into InDesign and that can be a little flaky sometimes. Um, generally speaking, issues with like, on the InDesign side and less on the Word side and what you want to make sure that either you or whomever's working on the InDesign side is that they don't copy paste. In other words, they don't copy the Word document and paste it in, that they're using the file place in. That person was for a ton of options in that. And if you know how to manipulate those options, you should be able to bring in your Word documents with your formatting intact. And I actually just put um, just a little reference point here that gives some good information about how to retain that formatting. So that's just good to know. Yeah. And then that's gonna bring me to my uh, 10 minute mark. I wanna have a chance to, for you to answer questions. I also wanted to put my contact information here. So if anybody has questions, um, I know, Loretta, you're going to send me your document to look at, and I'll take a peek at that and get back to you. Um, I'm happy to do that if anybody has any questions. Um, and then I just put a little quick bolded list about 
my company and what we do. And one of the things I'm going to do follow up for you tomorrow that I promised Brittany is uh, it does mention right here that we have a video training library. And I'm going to um, set all of you up with uh, 30 day access to, to give you a little bit of a free trial. There are very comprehensive word videos in there. So if you forgot something or you want to drill a little bit deeper, you can go in and, and take a look at those videos. Um, they're all broken down into roughly between two and five minute little snippets. So it's not like you're going to get stuck watching like a 45 minute video about word where, you know, you're going to want to shoot yourself after you'll be able to just watch little tiny snippets of videos on the topics that you want. So look for that tomorrow in your inbox. And the floor is now open for any questions that you may ask. It can also include things we didn't talk about. Well, first of all, thank you so much again for the 30 day access. That's just amazing. Um, and we're, we're definitely going to try to steal you again. So this is, this is, <laughs> you're, you make word fun. I'll tell you that. And oh, good. It's hard to do. <laughs> all right. I have a question. Yeah. Is there a, a quick in reliable way to add lines in a word document to create breaks? Like when you want to like outside of like a style like if you've got a section like a proposal and you want to like yep. outline a section rather than inserting a line and drawing it and try to make it match the right size is there like a quick way to insert a line in word so i think i understand what you're saying let me i've struggled and and sometimes they work and sometimes they don't and so basically what you want is like that yes but but i find that sometimes when i do it this way it gets locked to the paragraph yes. above or below, and then it sometimes makes it hard to do adjustments. Is there? Okay, so this is uh, lines, our borders, our paragraph formats. So that's the logic behind it, right? You're right. It does get stuck either to the paragraph above or below, right? So that's what's happening. So as I adjust this paragraph, the line is affixed to it. Yes, so you've got a couple of options here. So one is you could do this. You want a paragraph that's all by itself. And now if I put a line on that, it's a fixed and I can get rid of this guy if I want and I can get rid of this guy if I want. And if I turn off these, boom, okay. there you go. But because we know that this, this is a part of paragraph formatting, so it's going to get affixed to a paragraph. If I affix it to an empty paragraph, you can do whatever you want with it. Okay, that, that should help. Thank you. Yeah, I've just Great. kind of struggled with its relative yeah. position on the paper. Okay. Yeah, and my hope is that by helping to try to define for you character versus paragraph versus section or document format, you can actually start to kind of troubleshoot this on your own, right? Because you can go back and say, oh, of course it's stuck to that paragraph because <laughs> it's a paragraph format. Well, see, I never and the other option I was going to say is you so. can draw it. So that's, oh, I'm sorry, you can insert under shape. You could draw a line. And then, but the trick with this is it becomes uh, essentially an image, right? You see, I've got my little anchor, I've got my flow. So you can do it that way as well. Um, it just becomes a, a little trickier because it's going to float around with things. Good question, Carrie. Thank you. I will say one of, I mean, all of this is gold and just, I'm going to like probably listen to this 14 times, but I love how you said the, the parallels between just like a Windows Explorer. I did a couple of just tests and it, it's amazing. Just navigating. Um, amazing. Good. I'm glad. I'm yeah. glad. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Um. So uh, lots of comments. He has questions. a question in the chat. Yeah. Yes, Judy, if you change the style, e.g. heading one, will the change be there when you open a new Word doc? So by default, Judy, no. However, uh, let's take a look at this. I've got my little heading two here, and it's been customized a little bit. So I'm going to right click on it. And I'm going to choose modify. 
it's going to bring me into the full modification dialog box. If I look near the bottom down here, you see how it says right now, this customization is only in this document. If I switch that to new documents based on this template, this customized heading two style will be available to you when you go start a new file. But the first thing you do is you create or modify your styles the way you want. Then you come in here and choose this option and click OK. Actually, I, I better undo that because that's I'm going to be shocking myself tomorrow when all of a sudden my heading twos are weird. All right, anybody else? We still have three minutes. I can do a lot in three minutes. <laughs> you sure can. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't see anything else in the chat box except just a ton of your genius and amazing. So oh, thank you. I, I, well, listen, I don't want to. I don't want to blow two minutes. So let me quickly show you one other cool thing before before we're done. So again, looking on the ruler, we talked about the fact that this little icon at the beginning is my tab stops, but I didn't circle back on these little guys here. These are indentation markers. So that's what these guys uh, tell me right here. So for instance, if I wanted to do a first line indent, I can pick up that top triangle and drag it in. So that's what this does. This does some indentation. If I want to indent everybody from the left, I'm going to grab that little bottom line and everybody's going to come in. And I also have one here on the right I can drag in. So this is just a way of doing visually indentations as opposed to coming into the paragraph uh, dialog box launcher and setting up your indents in this section here. You can actually do it on the ribbon. And even if you choose not to do it on the ribbon, the fact that you know that that's what these icons represent can clue you in that this paragraph has special indentation set. And if this bottom triangle ever is moved independently from, oops, come here, you. There we go. This is how I create my hanging indent. So that's what these little boxes do. And it's super helpful for you to understand that they can move independently. They can move as a group. And depending upon how you move these and how they're separated will determine the kind of indentation you have set in your paragraph. I'd say that was well worth the three minutes. <laughs> Amazing. Great. Well, anybody else have any last comments, questions? No. Well, then I think we're going to, we're going to let you eat, Pam, because it's been it, it right. time for you. I'm going to start my dinner. Yeah. Thank you all so much. This was a blast. <laughs> I really, I really enjoyed our time together. I appreciate it. We can't wait to hang out again because it's going to happen. Awesome. All right. Thank you a million times, everybody. We have um, a round table coming up in a couple weeks for year end checklist. And then we have another one two weeks later for BPE. So I'll send that out with this recording. Hope to see you there. Have a good rest of your week and Pam will connect with you later. Sounds great. Thanks everybody. Bye guys. Bye.